when people think of Dutch art, they usually think of either the Dutch Golden Age, where you had painters like Rembrandt and Vermeer, or they think of Vincent van Gogh, who lived about two centuries later. But why is this? Why has Dutch art been typically delegated to these two categories? Well, the art of the Dutch Golden Age is because of the rise of the Dutch overseas empire in the first half of the 1600s. The Dutch Republic was a wealthy commercial and moderately religious nation, and as a result, the richer it became from its overseas empire, the more developed its domestic art market had become. Businessmen, surgeons, professors, local politicians all took an active part in the art market of their local city, commissioning works by local artists rather than those of other European countries, which gave the Dutch artists a steady market for roughly 80 years. This eventually declines in the 1670s and the 1680s, and when you have Dutch artists later on like Mondrian, Van Gogh, M.C. Escher, who are appreciated in the 20th century, it's largely a result of foreign interest as opposed to domestic. If there's anybody that can be particularly blamed for this shift, it would be France and Britain. The investments these countries made towards the end of the 1600s, both in overseas trade, made them grow very rich, coupled this with the growing secularism of Europe, and you can see why Paris and London would eventually win out over Amsterdam. However, an important thing to consider is that a great deal of Dutch art was not made for an overseas clientele, but rather for the local people during a chaotic period in which Europe suffered from the Thirty Years' War. When the war was over and France and England start to grow and secularize, eventually Dutch artists moved to Paris and London, kickstarting the great rise of art capitals in the 1700s. When looking at many of the old masters of Dutch art, we can see that many of them were made during the Thirty Years' War, when other nations simply didn't have as many artists or as many patrons to invest in Dutch or even their own art for that matter. It's important to consider that the Dutch were also Calvinists. The majority of Europe at the time saw them as pirates interfering with their trade empires, of the Habsburg family, who basically ruled all of Europe at this time. The Dutch were against the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, the highest offices at the time, and because of this, many markets were cut out for them. So because of this, they were largely opposed, those Catholic nations were opposed to doing any sort of business with the Dutch when they were revolting. This led the Dutch art community to set up guilds in many cities, and like I said before, it was called the Guild of St. Luke, where artists shared studios and showrooms, they instructed their own students, and created a staple market for commissioning and purchasing artworks within every city. It essentially worked like this. A person who was interested in having an artwork of themselves would go to a local artist in the city and pay them to create a work for them, we see this with Dr. Tolp, who commissioned the famous Anatomy Lesson from Rembrandt, as well as René Descartes, who commissioned a local artist of Harlem, Franz Hals, to paint his portrait. And this is applied more or less to every city in the Republic, whether it's Utrecht, The Hague, Delft, Middleburg. When we get to the reigns of King Charles II and Louis XIV, they declare war many times on the Netherlands and use their resources to build up their empires, while also investing in local art and culture of their own, kickstarting the possibility to have London and Paris finally outdo Amsterdam and the Dutch itself. So, while this system of purchasing artworks from local artists worked well, once other markets in Europe start to grow in the fourth quarter of the 1600s, we eventually see the old system fall apart. And by the 1700s, particularly after the War of Spanish Succession, the Dutch Golden Age is a romantic past, and everybody is buying works from everybody. Take, for instance, Louis XIV commissioning Dutch artist Jacob van Loo for a family portrait. Roughly a hundred years later, you have the Dutch head of state, William V, commissioning a royal portrait from an English artist rather than a local Dutch one. And later on, you have one of the prime ministers, Skimmelpenick, uh, 
commissioning a family portrait by a French artist, Proudhon. This is completely different from the Dutch Golden Age when local politicians and businessmen would commission works from their local artists to paint their families as opposed to a blue-chip foreign artist from France or England. So, the decline of the Dutch Golden Age of art is not so much that they ran out of artists, but rather that the market expanded both in terms of painters and patrons, and traditional art historiography moves its focus to France and England at this time. The art of 18th century Europe is all over the place, and artists flock to the main centers of Paris and London, as well as some other cities in the Holy Roman Empire, that it becomes very different from what we saw in the previous century. Take the works of Swedish painter Alexander Roslin, who was based out of France, or Canaletto, whose works were greatly collected by wealthy British tourists who wanted a souvenir from their trip to Venice. This period also saw a great boom in decorative art. This is why you hardly see anatomy lesson paintings, and when you do, such as this one by Cornelis Troost, 1728, it's nowhere near as good as the old Dutch masters. Or take this anonymous painting and compare it to the works of the 1600s, where you had more clarity, better framing, or when painters weren't afraid to get graphic. The anatomy lesson paintings in the 1700s practically appear anachronistic, but that's because many surgeons and professors simply didn't care to actually buy something like this. The demand wasn't there, so the works aren't all that common. Compare this work to this one by Miravelt about a hundred years before, and you see a remarkable difference. That's not to say that 18th century European art was, in, was just all bad. It's just that they prioritize other paintings. You see a great interest overseas, especially with the British in India, and other happenings in London, which brings us to our next topic. The great auction houses we know today, such as Christie's, Sotheby's, and Phillips, started as modest auctioneers in 18th century London. Unlike the Dutch, who had the guild system per city, the UK in the 1700s was more keen on amassing collections from both outside and inside their country, as well as studying art, leading to more publications of art criticism, more academic programs, the birth of museums and people visiting them more and more, and of course, the auction houses. This would grow even more in the 1800s when Britain was under Queen Victoria and had established itself as the main hegemon of the world. At the same time, Dutch art also had to compete with France. In this century, the 1800s is a time completely dominated by French art. We have in this painting Frederick Bazil, himself, the artist, talking to Edward Manet in his Paris studio. We also have Renoir poking about the stairs over there on the left, and a painting by Claude Monet is featured in the background wall. So, Paris in this time was really the center of it all, especially after the reforms of Napoleon III. You have a totally different Paris than the one of the first half of the century with Eugène Delacroix and Jericho, Later on, you have a Paris of great, great salons, of railroad projects. It's the Paris of the Eiffel Tower. So eventually, we do see Dutch artists pouring over the border and going over to these cities. So, for example, Van Gogh went to France, and so did Mondrian. Lawrence Alma Tadema, also a Dutch artist, went over to the UK. And another example is, continuously, this goes on in the 20th century, you have Willem de Kooning going over to the United States as an example of somebody leaving Europe completely. But despite the Netherlands having Indonesia and Suriname and still maintaining a strong port, they weren't thriving as much as France and the UK, where you had immense exhibitions, Olympic Games, countless events taking place, and this eventually becomes the Paris where 
people like Pablo Picasso and Salvador Dali, together with many Belgian and American artists, eventually go to. I should also point out that Austria and the fabulous Vienna art scene was also something that was happening. You had artists like Egon Schiel and Gustav Klimt, who would impact future generations when we get to the interwar years, and overall make a big leap in the modernist movement. But overall, Paris and London were still the dominant art capitals of Europe, and it would remain that way after World War I and going into the Cold War as well. Western Europe during the 1970s, however, had started growing their markets in West Germany and in Switzerland, that when we get to the 80s, we have the Netherlands consolidating its market in a push for better competition. Part of this later comes in 1991 when they added a modern and contemporary section to their iconic Maastricht Fair called TFAF, or the European Fine Art Fair, which is located in Limburg, closely convenient to Belgium, Germany, and France, and also not too far away for London as well. But despite this advancement, Dutch contemporary art itself has never truly came back to have the power that it did in the 17th century, at least not overseas, largely because of the immense European and overall the whole world competing for patrons and artists and institutional commissions and all sorts of different deals. So in many ways, the old system of Dutch patrons buying foreign artists and foreign patrons that we saw in the 1700s still exist today under a more dynamic and globalized system. Here you have a British lord, Charles Saatchi, buying Dutch artist Michael Redeker, as well as a Chinese festival commissioning works from Florentine Hoffman, while Dutch buyers like Bert Kroik look to overseas for their investments by an American artist, Kari Upson. So this is what makes the Dutch Golden Age stand out and appear as this booming market, this tulip mania period, when really it was the result of an unrecognized nation with very strict restrictions for its guild members, its painters, and also a habit of cultural isolationism as it is revolting and building its trade empire. The Dutch residents at the time acquired those works, the night watch, the musician playing his lute, the matchmaker, all by local artists because it was cheaper. It was all they knew, and it was a way to help out their local community. Once the Netherlands is recognized and the rest of Europe starts catching up with its art market and its art demand, inevitably we see the globalization that will take place. Thank you for watching this video and feel free to like, comment, and share.